let us talk about this problem we are given a number n our task is to count trailing zeros in factorial of this n for example if n is 5 then its factorial is going to be 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5 now if i compute this value i am going to get 120 and 120 has one trailing zero let's see another example if n is 10 then we are going to get 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 and if we compute this value, we are going to get 362880. And this number has two trailing zeros in factorial. If you take n equal to 100, you are going to get a huge number with 24 trailing zeros. So our output is 24. Now please pause this video and try to write down a function that takes an integer n as an argument returns another integer which is count of trailing zeros in the given number n. Let us first talk about a naive solution to solve the problem. The idea is simple. We first compute factorial of the given number. After computing the factorial, we count how many trailing zeros this factorial has. So for computing the factorial, we initialize the factorial as 1. Then we run a loop from 2 to n and inside the loop we multiply the factorial with i. Right, so we get 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 and so on till n. And after we have computed the factorial, we initialize the result as 0. And while the factorial is divisible by 10, right, we divide the factorial by 10. And while it is divisible, we keep on incrementing the result also. And at the end, we return the result. So if n is 10, we are going to get this as factorial. Then we are going to do two iterations. In the first iteration, we are going to remove this 0 and increment the result. In the next iteration, we are going to remove this 0 and increment the result, right? So result now becomes 2 and at the end, we return the result. Let us now talk about time complexity of this solution. So this solution clearly takes theta n time because we have a theta n loop here and this is less than theta n. So we can say overall time complexity is theta n. The major issue with the solution is it's going to cause overflow even for slightly higher values of n. For example, when you have n equal to 20, the factorial is going to have 19 digits in it, right? And 19 digits may not be stored in your data types or data types like int. So please pause this video and try to think of a solution which does not have overflow issues and has time complexity less than theta n. Let us now discuss the idea for efficient solution. The idea is to count how many 2s and 5s we have in the prime factorization of the given factorial. So if you have a number and you want to count how many trailing zeros this number has, if you write down prime factorization of this number and if you count how many 2s and how many 5s I have and if I, if I consider both 2s and 5s as pairs, I can count how many trailing zeros I am going to have because 2 and 5 together form a trailing zero. So in case of factorials, I'll write the factorial this way. And if I can somehow count how many 2, 5 pairs I have in the factorial in the prime factorization, I can count the trailing zeros. And here is one more interesting fact about factorials. The number of 5s are going to be less than number of 2s. So I simply need to count how many 5s I have in the prime factorization. Let's see this factorial example. I have written general factorial here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to n. And if I want to count how many 5s I, I'm going to have in the prime factorization of this factorial number, which is multiplication of all, I can notice that every fifth number here that I've written is going to have 5 as a prime factor, right? So I am I'm sure that if I am having a number n, then there are at least n by 5 5s in the prime factorization because this number has a 5, this number has a 5, then 15 is going to have a 5, then 20 is going to have a 5, then 25. But I'm saying at least, not exact. Why? Because there are some numbers which are going to have more than 1 5s as prime factors. For example, number like 25, right? There's a number 25 here, right? And then we have n. So 25 has 2 5s as prime factors. So we need to consider these also. Now please pause this video and try to write down a complete generalized formula and a generalized implementation that counts trailing zeros using this idea. Here is general formula. We do n by 5 floor, right? This is floor function. Then we do n by 25 floor. Then we do n by 125 floor. So when you do n by 5 floor, it counts 1 1 prime factor of all the numbers which are multiple of 5. 
and the numbers which are like 5 10 15 20 they have only one factor only and we have counted that and we have also counted one prime factor of 25 as well and we are yet to count one more prime factor so to count one more prime factor we consider every 25th number as well and we increment the count for every 25th and when you are counting every 25th number you are counting actually two prime factors of 125 as so one prime factor you counted when you did n by 5 and one more prime factor you counted when you did n by 25. The third prime factor can be counted when you do n by 125. If your number n is greater than 125, right? If your number is greater than 125. Otherwise, you can stop here. If n is say 24, then you can stop here. If n is say 100, then you can stop here. If n is 124, you can stop here. If n is 127, then you can stop here. That's your count, right? So now you get an idea, you get a formula, right? We, we can stop this formula when we get a zero, whether we get a zero here or here or later, we can stop. So now please implement this formula, write a function that takes a number n and returns count of trailing zeros. Let us now see implementation of the efficient approach. So what are we doing here? We initialize a variable i with five, right? And we are multiplying i with five. So we first compute n by five, and we add it to the zero, right? Initially result is zero. Then we compute n by 25 because in the next iteration, i is going to become 25 and we add it to the current result. Then we compute n by 125 and we add it to the result, right? That's what we are doing in every iteration. We are multiplying i with five and we are adding n by i to the result. So let's do a dry run with this example. Say n is 1, uh, 251, our result is initially zero. In the first iteration, i is 5. So we are going to do 251 divided by 5. And when we are doing integer division, it's anyways going to give us floor, right? So we are going to get 251 divided by 5 and floor, because it's an integer division, we are going to get 50. So our result becomes 0 plus 50, 50. In the next iteration, we get i equal to 25, right? So 25 we divide it by 251, 251 divided by 25 is going to give us 10, right? It's an integer division, so it's going to give you floor. So you get 60. In the third iteration, you get 251 divided by 125, so you get two. So the result becomes 62. You do not have any more iterations because after this, your i becomes 625 and 625 is more than 251. So we run this loop while i is smaller than or equal to n. This is how we get our result. Now let's analyze the time complexity of the solution. We begin with i equal to 5. In the first iteration, i is 5 raised to the power 1. In the next iteration, we are going to multiply i with 5. So i is going to become 5 raised to the power 2. In the third iteration, i is going to become 5 raised to the power 3. So if this iteration happens k times, then 5 raised to the power k is going to be smaller than or equal to n, right? So how many iterations we have? We'll have k is smaller than or equal to log base 5n. So the time complexity of the solution is theta of log n, right? If k is the number of iterations we do, then k is smaller than or equal to log 5n, log base 5n. So we have the time complexity as theta of log n. So this solution has less time complexity than the previous solution and solves the major issue of overflow. We are not going to have overflows here because we are not computing the factorial. We are dividing the given number with multiples of 5 here.